Just when you least expect it, emergencies can arise. If you find someone who has collapsed, they may be going through a cardiac arrest. You need to act fast. Hello, welcome to the Chronicles of an African Diaspora Nest. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, I'm bringing you another inspiring story from a nurse based in the diaspora. And I'll let him introduce himself to you in a minute. But if you are new to this channel or you've come across this channel for the first time, it's all about giving back to Africa in the areas of health and education. So I hope you would enjoy this conversation and be inspired as you listen. So Andrews, welcome to the channel. Ma'am, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. So can you tell us a bit about yourself, your role, what you are doing currently, and how long have you been in the U.S. for? So I'm um, simple. I'm just a very simple guy um, from Kumasi. I've been in the U.S. for Maybe about 15 years, um, I lived in Minnesota, but I joined the Navy and traveled around and finally um, living in Maryland. Um, it's been a great journey. Um, I have no regrets, but just some very good and sound memories, you know, about my journey um, throughout. Yeah. I like the bit about the fact that you you didn't train in Ghana. You came to US on a different profession. And this is something that I always say, because when we hear about Ghanaian nurses in the diaspora, I think what comes to mind, many people's mind is, oh, people who are nurses and they've left and come to the diaspora. But there are people like yourself who came on a different route and ended up being a nurse. So can you tell us a bit about that? How, how did you get into nursing? You were in the army before. Yes. So, yeah, so um, my journey, into nursing and healthcare in general is interesting, but I always tell people a very good story of somebody that I met many, many, many years ago who mm -hmm. prophesied to me and I never listened. So um, when I was going to university, I went to Gadi City University College in Kumasi, and there was this um, admissions counselor or whatever she is. She looks at me and she's like, become a nurse or a doctor. I'm like, oh, me a nurse or a doctor. You know, it was those days IT, was becoming a thing, you know, and everybody loved you when you do IT. So I'm like, no, I'm going to do computer science. So um, I did computer science. I did some few IT jobs here and there, you know, and um, worked with a couple of um, people in Ghana. But when I came to the U.S., um, my friend was like, join the Navy. So I was actually in the Navy. And um, when I joined the Navy and I was looking for a job, you know, like when you go, they give you job options. And I'm like, I want IT. And they're like, no, you're not a U.S. citizen. You couldn't do IT. And I'm like, oh, that's a bad plan. So um, <laughs> I just asked them to give me anything, and they gave me a hospital call man. So hospital call man's job is just like a technician at a hospital, right? So I went, um, did the training, and it was good, and I loved it. So I did my basic training, came to my first command, and then God blessed me with a child. You know, my first child is called Eliana. So um, when she was born, she aspirated meconium, all right? And then she was in the NICU for about a whole week, you know? And every time I go to the NICU, the way the nurses were taking care of her, was my idea was like, oh, I'm going to do my five, five years, get out and go get some IT jobs. Mm -hmm. But the way they took care of my daughter, it had a very good impact on, on me. And that is how I ended up becoming a nurse, you know, just because those nurses did a very, very good job. Wow. So... Um, currently, what is the role? I mean, we've got different specialties of nursing. So what do you work in? Which specialty nursing? Okay, so I do emergency nursing. So I work um, in the uh, emergency room. I think initially my idea was just to be an emergency nurse, but now I fall in love with trauma. So I'm now working on becoming a, tra a trauma certified nurse, you know, yeah. And still work within the emergency room environment, yeah. There's no wonder that you're doing what you're doing currently. Yes. Which I'm sure you, you tell us more about. Mm -hmm. But before then, I just wanted to ask this question. What would you describe as your greatest achievement in your whole nursing career? How, so how long have you been a nurse for? I've been a nurse for two years, exactly. Two years. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're mm -hmm. doing a lot. Yes, yes, <laughs> I am. And um, I think my 
greatest achievement um, as a nurse is the um, relationship that I'm able to build with my patients. Um, I was walking down the street, um, I think yesterday with my kids and uh, somebody stood by and just waved and said, hi. And I'm like, do I know you? And she's like, you took care of my dad like two days ago was I worked and I'm like, oh, wow, you know, and it's America, you know, it's not Ghana that everybody will say hi to you, you know, so for the person mm -hmm. to really stand by and just say, you know, hi, you took care of my dad, you know, and my hospital was about 35 minutes away from here. So apparently they traveled all the way, you know, to that hospital and it was, it was, it was neat. So that is what I call uh, an achievement, you know, and uh, my work people, I've had a couple of days I was in the uh, nominations which makes me feel very very happy you know i don't think i would go back to it you know anymore i this is this is it for me yeah i don't blame you yeah being <laughs> an of the job satisfaction is yeah to none. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you for all you do so thank now you. you're working in ghana what inspired you to give back because you know now everybody is running away from mm -hmm. not only ghana africa Everybody wants green pastures. We all come. It's not everybody who has the heart that, you know, I want to go back and give something back. But I know that there are individuals, I haven't done this myself in the past, that there are people who really have the heart, compassion to do that. So for you, what was the point? What made you make a decision that, you know, I am going back? And from what you are telling me, you've, qualified for two years mm -hmm. yeah and yet you're doing all that you're doing so what what was it that made you give back oh, okay so um i think myself as an individual i've been running ngos for a long 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 time you know people um who know me back in ghana and um, especially in kumasi know that i've done different things but healthcare was really new field um for me so I had an organization called Agape Village of Hope International when I was way back in Ghana that we're going to communities and giving books and doing. I actually have my partner organization is in um, the UK. They call themselves Awesome Books. You know, they're a bookseller. Mm -hmm. So they'll ship books to me in Ghana and I travel everywhere and I give the books. But somewhere in Ghana, I was working. Those people that know Kumasi a lot, I was working down a doom and at Pampaso. You know, I do um, I had my laptop on me. I was like, I'll go to cafes, I'm going to campus, and just right in front of me, somebody passed out. And then I didn't know how to describe it as how I felt it, you know. So we all stood around the person, the person was shaking, uh, saliva was coming out of the mouth and everything, and we all stood there. And then later some man comes around and said, Oh, whoa, well, I'm like, ah, how did the person die? You know, and I'm like, oh wow. So this this is something you know and i saw different things in in kumasi where you know like kjtr somebody will fall off and die a vehicle will hit somebody and they're like oh the person has died so when i joined the navy and we went to basic training our first training the guy comes fall to the ground and pretend as if he's <laughs> passing out foam is coming around and then somebody comes by turn the person to the left side put a foam under his head and then there's like, this is what you do when somebody gets a seizure. I'm like, what? What? I, I was like, I was looking around and I was like, wow, this is what you do when somebody has a seizure. So the, mm -hmm. the way he acted, that scenario was the same thing that I saw at Pampaso. That person that died many, many years ago was having seizure, but none of us knew anything, anything yeah. to do. And even today, people don't even know what to do when people, um, when somebody's having a seizure, or when something happens. So right there after my training that day, I called my wife, who was my girlfriend then. Um, she was back in Ghana. I'm like, I saw this training. Uh, and this is something very simple that we could do to save people's lives. So I called a few people and um, spoke to them. And then we started at the Deco Foundation. You know, mm -hmm. And um, with the foundation, our well, goal was really to give out, go to the communities and give public education. Right? So... We started with radio, so we're going to Sunsum FM in Kumase every Monday, and really people are coming on board and like, oh, this thing you're saying on radio, you know, it's really helping out, you know. So we've been doing that since 2016, just making sure that we get the information out to the communities, and then we started doing free head screening. Um, so we, we did that, and um, I am glad that today there's a lot of organizations that have come on board to see that, hey, 
public education is very, very important. You know, I'm always grateful for those that started the Lidepo Foundations with me. Um, Dr. Presla Pukia, she doesn't work with our organization anymore, but she was really on the ground. I was here, I sent some small dollars, and then she'll go around, you know, and get the things done. And I always tell people that I take the credit for the Deco Foundation, but it is actually the volunteers down in Ghana. I'm <laughs> just the idea bearer. But now the Deco Foundation has changed, you know, our vision. I think I've become a little bit more biased because I'm in emergency medicine. So I've changed our vision to focus on pre-hospital emergency care, you know. Yeah. So we work with National Ambulance Service to develop programs where we can train people in the community to prepare them if emergencies happen before, by the time they wait for National Ambulance Service to come, they should have been able to do something, you know. So that is how our journey has, it's been interesting, but I've loved every part of it, you know. Uh, stories people tell me, like when you're in Ghana and the people see your angel, it's like, oh, the Jacob Foundation, I learned this from you. You know, it's been, it's been a very big lesson. I know you've talked about public ed education and that a lot of organizations have come on board and are doing mm -hmm. that, but can you just stress how important it is for people to have those health screenings? Yeah, so I love to be very personal when I have conversations with people. So I had my mother come here um, a few years ago, and um, when she came, she's like, oh, I can't read. I'm like, you can't read? Like, you give her something. Mm -hmm. If you're standing afar, she can't, she can't read, you know? And yeah. um, we, I took her to the hospital, and... Um, when I when the doctor said she had latent syphilis, you know, and I'm like, oh wow. So she has lived with the, that condition for a long time and was getting to a point where she was about to lose her eyesight, you know. And I'm like, okay, that is why going to the doctor, getting physical assessment is is very important because she had been fortunate to come here. And I know her story is not unique. There are many, many, many people back in Ghana who don't seek medical care. And even myself. When I was back in Ghana, I, I didn't, you know, and I met a lot of Ghanaians here in the diaspora. It's like, oh, then my head busy, meet me in call hospital, you know. They, they choose not to go to the hospital because they are busy, because they can't afford, and because of um, accessibility, you know. So it's important because you really never know what is wrong with you. And our body, um, I think I had one friend who said, our body is like a car. You buy a car, it's a brand new car. You're really enjoying it. But the more you use it, you know, you start losing um, some few things about us, you know. So it's very important that we continue to um, go out, you know, check ourselves up. I was at a gym today and things that I could do 10 years ago, I can't do, you know. I'm getting old and I have a lot of gray hair, you know. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's very important that we, we yeah. seek family care. So I'm really, really grateful that now more organizations are there and people are saying, okay, who here? Say, made the medical project care, you know, it's very important that I seek I say care. Yeah, I could agree with you more. It's very, mm -hmm. very important. And I'm sure yeah. we all have personal stories, and I'm sure somebody listening would have a personal, you know, experience and be able to relate to that as well. Now, yeah. let's talk about your, your focus now and your recent trip to Ghana. But before then, you know, the, the, the first time I came into contact with Ellie Jekyll, I mean, I've seen it on LinkedIn, but the first time I came into contact with people actually doing the training in Ghana was in January when I was in Ghana and I attended the GDNA conference and they had partnered with you to train the nurses on CPR. I had the opportunity to speak to one of your volunteers and he talked about the work of Eli Jekyll. So, so tell us about what you went to do. I know he's on CPR, trauma and mm -hmm. I saw all the pictures, you know, stop the bleeding and all of that. Tell mm -hmm. us about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um my trip to Ghana was really, really good. Um we traveled from Accra to Western North, you know, so we did program from all the way from Accra up to Western North um Ghana. And um, our teaching was really focused on pre-hospital emergency care, that mm -hmm. um, if a grandpa, an auntie, or a sister falls down, what should somebody be able to do? If you go to the market, you're buying your meat, and the butcher guy you know, cuts himself, you know, what is he going to do, or what can we do um, to help the, the person? So that is what we did. So um, from Western North, we trained nursing students, so we went to 
Uh, most mostly all the nursing schools out there, and we did CPR training uh, with them. Uh, we showed them how to use AEDs, how to do hands mm -hmm. fully um, CPR. And then we came down, and in Accra, we trained the military. So military, I'm a military person. We are the forefront of um, emergency preparedness. So if something is to happen, the emergency would respond. And most of our partnership in Elijeko have been very strategic. You know, we we partner with organizations that really are the forefront of um, emergency response. We are working on trying to get Ghana police so that we can train them. So our goal was really do an intro for the military. Our goal was do an intro training, show them what we can do. And we trained the military police, you know, when we were in Ghana. And then we went to the military nursing training school and we trained the nurses. So our focus really, again, was CPR, you know, pre-hospital CPR and in-hospital CPR for the nurses and then stop the bleed, you know, bleeding control and trauma management, basic, basic, basic trauma management, you know. And again, back to another story, I was here. Um, so we, we never thought of doing trauma training, you know, and um, three or four years ago, somebody sent me a video and was one of my seniors at university in Ghana. He had an accident. He did not die um, from the accident but he died early based on how they moved him. And the people don't know. The people were willing to go out and help him. But when I watched the video, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going for a nail kuno. And my wife was like, I don't know more kuno. It was all because of how they held him. He died because of how the people moved him. You know, he survived the accident. But the people, they were just doing their best. They, they thought they were helping um, him, but they ended up, you know, killing him because of how um, they held him. And if you've seen recently on the news, I think I posted it on my LinkedIn, Le Wen, a very popular person in Ghana, had an accident. And he's fortunate, but he could have died only because of how they were moving him. So yeah. our goal was really to teach people, as it didn't happen everywhere, but if people know how mm -hmm. to really properly, you know, assist mm -hmm. people when um, accidents happen, it would be it would be helpful. And I think those our training was received Sorry, we are going back to Ghana in October to train again with the military. But we are hoping to do the train the trainer program where we can train more people to go out and do more training. Yeah. That's impressive. So mm -hmm. together in all, how many professionals or staff, I mean, were you able to train on that trip? We trained we train a lot. I think the military, we yeah. train about 350 military okay. folks. Um, we train about 300 nurses. And then yeah. um, the nursing school was was a lot, you know, about fifteen hundred, you know, yeah. for for the nurses. Yeah, but we spent a lot of time in Western North. Yes, yeah. I think it's it's a really important essential training that you know health workers should have. Because I was having a chat with somebody that was some time last year about you know mandatory training for healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, you know, people who work in there, and um, what they were telling me was like. The training wasn't, not many people had that opportunity to have that training. So I think mm -hmm. what you are doing is meeting a need. So are you also training like bystanders, the, the general public? Do you have any plan for that? I know you're focusing on the professionals. Yeah, so our program is in two folks. So we have the bystander CPR. Actually, that is our main focus. The bystander okay. CPR, you know, so okay. that, like, I gave an example that if your grandma happens to fall yeah. out at, at work. So our main program is the bystander CPR. And um, I think here in the U.S. or Europe, they call it the hands only CPR, right? Okay. So that is what we actually um, do. So we have videos. Uh, we've made a whole CPR video so that people can watch. Uh, I'm working with some of the TV stations in Ghana to see if they would want to air this so that people can see. But it's online where people can learn. Okay. So our focus really is the bystanders people at home you know so that they will know what to do and actually we are actually teaching people the number for national ambulance service because a lot of people don't know it you know so um we're using the platform to um provide more of those education to people thank you so much for the work that you do so a program of this magnitude is not without challenges mm -hmm. so what are some of the challenges that you you, you face obviously you're working with partners on the ground in Ghana, and you have partners in the US as well. And there's a lot of liaising and arranging things and, you know, collaborating and all of that. What are some of the challenges that you face and 
how have you overcome them? Um, the challenges, like every organization, has been yeah. um, a lot. One is because I am here and I'm not in Ghana um, yeah. full time, and also getting volunteers who do understand um, the purpose of volunteerism. You know, I think our Ghana, our culture, we are not trained um, mm -hmm. on the idea of oh, I am volunteering. You know, so we we've had a lot of struggle. We've had days that we had like a full house of volunteers. So like two or three, you know, um, volunteers because people come with different visions um, for the organization. So getting people who are dedicated to the vision has been one of the biggest challenges. But I am always grateful to the people that have spent their time, those that yeah. started with us and those who are still with us. Like I think when you go went to Ghana, you met Chum. Chum has been with us for a long time. Nurse mm -hmm. Gift has been with us for a very long time, you know, and just finding dedicated people like like um, them is the biggest thing. And I think the second thing, um, biggest challenge is finances, right? Um, mm -hmm. My organization, we do not ask for donations from anywhere. Everything is self-funded. So my wife mm -hmm. and I, we did agree that um, our tithes will go to a legal foundation and whatever God blesses us with, we'll use it to support the organization. And uh, I'll be here for a long time. I've worked in different organizations and I saw people coming from Africa to here and just going out and asking for donations but go home and don't use the money for what they came for yeah. so I told uh, myself and my wife that we wanted to build a level to a point where we have something to prove you know yeah. and so I've met a lot of people and they're like oh you're doing this and they're not asking for donations and people are like oh oh Sikapa, because you do NGO and I'm like no <laughs> awesome. everything ev yeah everything is self-funded mm -hmm. so my wife and I um, we, we fund the organization since 2016, but then we found an innovative way of doing um, running the organization so that it doesn't come only from our pockets. So we have a travel business, you know, so um, I have a travel agency. We sell plane tickets. So when people buy plane tickets from us, the commission that we get, we get, we put small aside, you know, and um, we put that funding together. But it's interesting. Sometimes our vision was really very small. But now it's becoming big that we, we are thinking of maybe finding a better way of raising yeah. funding so that we can continue um, the work that we are, we are doing, you know. Because when it started, it was a very small thing. Now it's, it's very yeah. big. Yeah, I pray that you get destiny helpers. You never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, can, who, who will support. But, but then again, I mean, as we are having this conversation, if anybody sees this and touches their heart and they want mm -hmm. to, they want to maybe donate something, whether material or, you know, funds. Can they do that? Yes, um, <laughs> they, they can. I think we've gotten to a point where our doors are open for anyone going to um, support in any way. We ask that people volunteer with us. So um, nurses here, doctors here, they're like, oh, I want to give you some money. I'm like, no, go yeah. with me to Ghana. So like the group that are traveling with me in October, they're coming from Oregon. They wanted initially to donate. I'm like, no. Let's go go to the ground and touch people and just exchange so people can support. Uh, we need more mannequins. I think we have more, but we could use more. And um, any, I guess, people also have, you know, to, to support us. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. The next question I would like to ask is, this has been a topical subject for so many years when it comes to brain drain, the fact that those of us who've traveled abroad in something we need to go back and, and, and help turn it into brain circulation. And I know many people have come back over the years. Some people go, what's your take on that? The African diaspora and development of Africa. Um, my answer will be a little bit biased because I'm a travel agent, um, but <laughs> traveling is as old as civilization, right? Yeah. Um, but I really love what GDNA is doing that yeah. getting people together and going back and doing the knowledge transfer. There's a proverb that if you haven't gone to somebody's farm, you think you are the only farm. Uncle be a former, or you someone quite now you see um being able to travel outside of Ghana really expands your knowledge. It opens your eyes like, oh wow, is this this is yeah. out there, you know? And then um, but I really want to encourage people that when they come, they should go back. You know, I go to Ghana three or four times a year, even before the joke, when people are like, oh, you travel so much. I'm like, I always want to go back and tell that next guy, you know, what I saw and what I yeah. think we can implement, you know. And um, we've had many, many conversations about nurses and people going back to do more in Ghana. So um, when I heard about GDNA, I'm like, 
wow, this is what this is what we need, you know. So the knowledge transfer is very, very important. And if people want to travel and it's a better opportunity for them, let's encourage them, but then let's also encourage them to go back and um, and give. And also back to the leaders in Ghana or in, even in Africa to open the avenues. Because, madam, it's not easy when you want to go do something in Ghana, you know, the red tapes that you have to go through, the money that you have to pay to people. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm coming to do this, you know. So hopefully our leaders will see the need for knowledge transfer and will also be very willing to open the door. I'm not saying that they should make things so easy so that everything yeah. can come into the system, but they should open open up things um, so that we will be able to um, give more um, information, more knowledge, you know, to, to, to expand, you know, in our knowledge transfer. And now I saw that they have their online CEs for nurses to go in, you know, and there's a lot, a lot we can do, even in the yeah. health sector. That yeah. um, one of the things that we've been, I have been thinking about is to do um, the skills fair, you know, where we, we take, and I think GDNA is doing, they did the wound training where we actually take things yeah. to Ghana and say, hey, this is how we set up an IV pool. And I'm telling you, nurses that are in Ghana are very skilled because they do a lot with yeah. less, you know. Yeah. So if we can have something like skills fair, go and just have them do the hands-on instead of just the presentation, like get them doing more hands-on. So um, we need people to go back. We need everyone to go back like you and I are doing, you know, just to, and that small village community clinic. And I think we were talking about adopt a clinic project where there's a clinic in some village. We just go and adopt that clinic and work with the nurses to keep them up to speed with evidence-based practices, you know, and the current day practice. Well, there are some things that we do in Ghana that are really archaic, you know, so we have to find a way to um, mm -hmm. educate them and get more people in line with current things, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And mm -hmm. um, I hope that, you know, somebody listening will be inspired. Um, and I know that some people have ideas they're thinking or oh, can I go is it is this doable but when you hear stories such as yours it does gives us inspiration and encouragement and motivation to to take action and do something so thank you so much Andrews for sharing your story with us yes, I really appreciate it and the last question is optional you don't have to answer it do you see yourself settling back in Ghana anytime soon? No, it's actually a very good question <laughs> and it's a big yes. Um, I have tried and then I paused. So uh, mm. my plan actually was to relocate to Ghana last year and even this year. But I have smaller kids, you know, my oldest is nine years, you know, and the boss is not planning to go to Ghana anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's unfair to leave the children with her and just move to Ghana. That is why I go to Ghana frequently. Um, it's been it's been a plan for a long time. Um, I was doing a week trip to Ghana, now I'm doing a month, you know, I'm doing two months just to see how um, it will go. But I need to be here also for the children, you know. So I would eventually uh, move move back to um, to Ghana and explore other options. But you said something about people having ideas. Um, if you have ideas and you don't do it, it sticks with you. You know, and I know it's difficult getting things done in Ghana, but you still once in a while find somebody very, very faithful that would take the vision and run with it. You know, like when we did the Jacob Foundation, Dr. Priscilla um, Pokia, she took the vision and ran with it. And then she got to a point and other people came on board and they're also running with the vision. So it will be difficult doing things in Ghana, you know, of, because it's hard to find trustworthy people, but there's always that one person that will take a vision and um, run with it. Um, you asked me a question, but I'm really going to take the advantage to thank my, you know, my volunteers. They've been very, yeah. very helpful. We couldn't have done this without them. It's all about giving back, and there's so many ways we can do that. So thank you, and I wish you all the best in your up and coming trip. I wish I was in Ghana to stop by. Who knows? I may be. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for watching, and I hope that you've been inspired. Till the next time, take care. Bye.